Hi everyone, thank you very much for stopping by and returning to the old world. This weekend just gone, I've managed to get in the first game with my tale of Project Force, the forces of the Empire, and it was against fellow tale of gamer Tim with his Chaos Warriors. Not only would this be the first game I've managed to get in with my Empire Force, it's also my first game of Warhammer the Old World at 2,000 points. What follows is not going to be a blow-by-blow -blow battle report, rather I'll give a summation of what's happened, really a focus on my thought process and learning points, of which there were quite a few during the course of the game. But first of all, let's have a look at the list. So, this is the force that I brought to the table. One of the things I realised from the previous game I'd had against Bretonians is the importance of mobility, something my dwarf force does not have in spades. So I was keen to make sure I had plenty of mounted forces. And also when it came to the option of putting up chaff or interfering with people's charges, I realised that I didn't want to rely on impetuous units to do that. So where I was originally thinking of bringing pistoliers to the table, eventually I brought two units of Outriders instead. Now, because Warhammer is supposed to be, anyway, a rank and flank game, I felt I really needed at least one block of infantry. So 21 veteran state troops with full command spear shields. They did have a magic banner as well. I've not included the magic stuff on the list that I'm showing you, you know, just in case. I can't give away all my secrets. But their job was really to act as the second line, able to block stuff up if necessary. And we're going to be housing my bunker wizard together with the BSB. Coming into the game, there was one unit I was a little bit concerned about, which was the mortar. Now, I wasn't entirely sure it offered enough value at 95 points to make it worthwhile bringing but it's it's a model I had ready I'm using the halfling hot pot for it so it's it's a classic figure I really like so I wanted to give it a bit of an outing and as I say it was ready and I had a bit of a dash to get enough models um, glued together for this particular game anyway but it's likely effective was uh, was definitely a factor I was thinking about coming into the game for his part, Tim had to take in this force. Again, I've not listed all of the magical gizmos here. We saw how a Chaos Lord and Sorcerer Lord on demonic mounts, they did protect quite a bit of threat, but tended to, we found, get hemmed in quite a lot and actually didn't have as much maneuverability as Tim had perhaps hoped. And there was a Chaos Champion, or whatever it is that they're called, Aspiring Champions maybe, not playing Chaos Warriors at the moment, so don't really know. Um, the BSB on a Steve, now he went in the Warrior block, and there was a minus one leadership aura coming from that force. I think it's if you could see it, you got minus one leadership. That was quite nasty. Uh, some chaff units in the form of Hounds and Marauders. Five Chaos Chosen Knights were something I was definitely a little bit concerned of, along with the Hell Cannon. And um, yeah, and then there was a bunch of ogres with great weapons. So let's talk about how the game went down. I was fortunate enough to get turn one, and because Tim had opened up the deployment by placing his Hell Cannon, I'd been able to make sure that my artillery had a line of sight to it. Now, I was most worried of his forces about the Hell Cannon. This was followed in really force prioritization order by the Chaos Knights and then the Chaos Warriors. Turn one with the really useful assistance of the engineer and throughout the game, the engineer proved its absolute weight in gold. The artillery opened up and managed to take out the Hell Cannon. So that was 200 odd points, turn one in my favour, and really took a huge blow to the Chaos firepower when it came to the shooting phase, leaving it with just a couple of spells 
it could chuck about. Other than that, turn one was fairly cagey. A couple of the dogs were killed in my shooting phase, and one of my regular knights was killed by a magic spell. Not a lot happened, all quite cagey. I did, however, move up my Imperial Knights fairly aggressively, and I think I'm slightly concerned around the potential impact of getting charged by them, was hemmed into a position where a lot of his units were getting in each other's way and not being aggressively pushed forward. He really didn't enjoy the power projection from these knights, which was quite an interesting take. Turn two, well, that continued to be a fairly cautious affair. My Empire Knights continued to sit in the middle of the table and really just have a power projection role, trying to prevent the Chaos Force from advancing too swiftly. The artillery wasn't that effective this turn. Just a couple of Chaos Warriors being killed, one by a cannon and one by one of my archers. In the Chaos turn, the Chaos Warriors had a spell cast on them to give them the fly keyword and to move them forward swiftly, with a view to preventing my knights from getting a long distance charge and too much of a buff to their initiative. And then it came that fantastic Hollywood moment. The chosen Knights of Chaos launched a long range charge at my knights of the inner circle, which were joined by my general. Now, had I decided to hold, turns out the Chaos Chosen Knights would have fallen short, leaving themselves horribly exposed to a charge in the next turn where they wouldn't have been able to use the counter charge. However, with a blare of horns and cries to the god Sigma, my inner circle knights instead dipped their lances and met their charge with a charge of their own. And with a scream of horses and a crash of steel, the two heavy cavalry units came together. When the dust had settled, a single chaos knight had fallen and they retired. The knights of the empire paused, gathered their breath and did not follow up, preparing for a charge in the following turn. And in turn three, charge they did. Now, Tim, for what whatever reason, I'm not entirely sure of the reasoning here, decided after much consideration that the chosen knights, rather than taking the charge, would instead flee. I think the aim here was to bring my inner circle knights into a position where he could start bringing other forces against them. Unfortunately, whilst the knights didn't manage to catch the fleeing chosen, what it did do is meant that they ran straight across the firing range of my artillery. The guns spoke, and all that remained was a single Chaos Chosen Knight. In the centre, faced with the aggression of the Chaos Warriors, my knights, normal knights, had no real option but to launch a charge into the face of the block of Nurgle Warriors. This didn't go well, and the knights were pushed back. In the bottom of turn three, the knights being forced to flee, although not being pursued. They then themselves rallied in turn four. In turn four, the artillery spoke again and four more Chaos Warriors fell. Things were about to turn for the worse for the Empire of Man. I was definitely at this stage feeling that the game was largely in control, although I was a little bit concerned around the Warriors charging up the middle. A lot of the other stuff would have been bogged down for a lot of the game, Really, they're getting in each other's way. And I was definitely feeling I was in a position of controlling a lot of the space, particularly with the artillery doing such a grand job, excluding the mortar, which was managing the grand total of diddly squat. But then it all started to go horribly wrong. The Chaos Warriors charged my block. Spearmen. Now, I had hoped that they would be able to take a round of combat, hold their ground or at least not fall back too far. This would have allowed for my knights to then charge the Chaos Warriors in the flank, 
reduce their static combat resolution and hopefully make a bit of a difference to the fight, turning the tide in the centre. That's not what happened. My veteran infantry scarpered and took two cannons with them. This was a massive swing and caused me really significant problems going into the last moments of the game. In the back line of the Chaos ranks, the Knights of the Inner Circle were involved in a running battle with the Chaos Ogres, but just couldn't get that decisive breakthrough. This eventually led to the Chaos Marauders charging them in the flank, albeit to pretty much negligible effect, other than giving some combat resolution to the Empire. But with the new rules in place, whereas I think in 7th or 8th edition, something like that, the forces of Chaos would have broken and been run down by the Knights of the Inner Circle. Instead, the fight became far more protracted than I needed it to be. And with my Knights so heavily occupied, it meant I wasn't able to come round and then offer support to my collapsing centre. In the dying moments of the game, the Chaos Lord rose from his seeming slumber and managed to take out a unit of Outriders, but overall didn't really have much of an impact upon the game. So there we have it. In the end, it was a quite a, well, large victory to the Chaos Warriors. My centre collapsing robbed me of a lot of points. My wizard and hero uh, carrying the battle standard bearer, being in the block of infantry that broke, plus giving up a standard with my knights didn't help the cause at all. On reflection, I definitely found that I think demonology is not the right choice of law for a bunker wizard. Now, there are some really good spells in the demonology law, but I don't think that having a wizard that's sitting in the back row as a supporting cast is really getting much value from that. So it's definitely something I need to think about. If I want to have that law, I need to give some more mobility to my wizard, so they probably need to be mounted on something. I mentioned at the start of the video that going into the game, I was a little bit concerned about the mortar and whether it would live up to 95 points of cost. And the short answer is, it didn't. I think it managed a couple of wounds over the entirety of the game. We did have a discussion around what kind of targets you would like to see. And with most of its blast template being strength 2, you're looking at stuff realistically no more than toughness 3 in reasonable armour. And outside of perhaps orcs and goblins in the core factions, maybe beastmen, um, to a certain extent, there's not going to be a lot of good targets on the typical battlefield for this weapon. Skaven might be different. Elves possibly different. But core factions... Yeah, we're not sure we're going to see an awful lot of things where the mortar is going to be fantastic. The third big point of takeaway, I think, for me is to remember that power projection of knights they're not as effective as you think they're going to be particularly if you are basing any thoughts around how things used to be there's a real importance to stay grounded in the rules of the old world and the way that combat now works stuff just doesn't disintegrate like it does anymore and i very much got caught into that trap with my inner circle of relying on them breaking through in order to come sweeping back round and support the centre. This simply didn't happen, and even with relatively low leadership, the Chaos Ogres were able to hang around for quite a while, even when they're on the, uh, on the receiving end of a bit of a battering. I've also, as an aside, definitely come to the conclusion that whilst my Imperial Knights were able to hold up the Chaos Force in the middle for quite a while through threat projection, I don't think that's a trick I'm going to be getting away with very often and particularly not long at all once people start getting more familiar with the game because quite frankly they don't punch hard enough to cause that much of a concern. I'm not going to be going ploughing through people's lines and 
as more and more people come to understand that, including me, and remembering that is an important factor, that sort of power projection from regular nights just isn't going to work. So what am I going to do about it? Well, I've got another game in the week ahead against Paul from Epic Flails Bretonians, again at 2,000 points. I'm probably not realistically going to have an awful lot of time to make changes to this force. I might change the Wizard's Law of Magic, but the rest of the force will probably have to remain unchanged purely because of the amount of time I've got to get models ready. I also don't want to make too many changes off the back of one game, just in case the uh, the conclusions I've drawn are slightly incorrect. That being said, I really don't think there's much future for the mortar in this force. I think that gives me 95 points to spend elsewhere. The question is, where do they go? Do I want to go down some kind of warrior mounted on a mounted beastie? Possibly, not sure. And do I want to get a steam tank into the list? Now, the steam tank doesn't fit the storytelling of my army at all, but I understand from the power of the internet that it is quite a powerful choice. Albeit, to bring that in would mean a quite a large reshuffle of the forces I've got available to me. But for now, it is game one under the belt. I definitely feel I've learned a lot from it, and there's a few things I can start to consider, even if I'm taking a material similar army in the week ahead. Thereafter, it'll definitely be back to the drawing board, I think, to redesign the army and to really take into account the learning points, both from this battle and for the ones I'm sure will come against the Bretonians. If any of you have played any games with Empire and have got any hot takes of things you think definitely should be included in the Force, do let me know down in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed listening to my ramble through the first game I've had with the Empire. I am returned to the old world. Have a great day.